We talk about 3D printing and dive into this world, and I'm so excited that we have so many uh, 3D printing co-partners in crime in here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about matter. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our production systems. This is what I've been studying and researching for the past uh, couple of few years. Um, our relation to matter actually is a very beautiful one. Our relation to consumption starts with beauty. Um, I love what Karl Marx said that uh, we are the only species, if you think about it, that produces stuff for other uh, people. And we don't only produce stuff for our families or our tribes nearby. We produce stuff for people that we will never meet. So in its core, it's quite a beautiful story. We're really social like that. And matter is socializing. But somewhere in between, matter has become alienating. And this is a lot that we've been talking about, right? We kind of ended up in this out of sight, out of heart kind of situation. And um, I think this has also been a bit the core common thread today when, uh, uh, when Matthias talked about experiencing climate change. Uh, we, I think a lot of the discussions circulate around this. We want to connect. Uh, Esther talks about it yesterday. We want to connect. And all the technologies up until this moment has only separated our relation to matter when it comes to production networks. So if you think about, um, let's say, um, the steam revolution. The steam revolution was the first time we separated uh, the distance between where we took some raw material, extracted it, and then we could actually put it on a steam-powered boat or railway and process it somewhere else and then further transport it and consume it somewhere else in the world. So technology has had this huge role in separating our relationship to raw material and consumption. And then we had the, uh, let's say, we had the electrification revolution, and that did the same. But it did it even more. Now we could call, uh, we could telegraph, we started telegraphing, then we called to plan the complex supply chain. And that, me that meant we could have... Um, activities that were really, really far away and still be able to, to plan really complex networks of production. And then with digitalization, we could codify even more all the different complex tasks of production. And this is really where this thing takes off, out of sight, out of mind. That we lose sight of who is producing, who's locked into these really tedious tasks, and what are the environmental effects. My, pro my sort of relation to uh, production started as, yes, I already mentioned Marx, and he opened my eyes to, um, to production with this simple formula. We talk about steam revolution, electrification, but this is the revolution that has enabled this alienation of matter, really. Um, it's the uh, one formula that encapsulates capitalism. M, C, M apostrophe. Marx saw that we are in a system of perpetuous growth that builds on us having money, that we can invest in capital, a machine, with which to gain more money in a distant future. And that is how our entire system is built up. And this pauses, poses the obvious question that got me into it, being interested about matter is how can we have a system built on infinite growth on a finite planet, right? Especially when he talked about this, the capital that we bought, especially raw material, were kind of free. We, it was just a matter of extracting it. And it was just a matter of who had the best technology that they had put their capital in to extract most and most and most, basically just race to the bottom in terms of matter. And so this got me really uh, anti-capitalist. This was about 10 years ago I first read uh, Capital uh, from Marx. And I wanted to fight capitalism as a system. But later on, I became a better economist. And I understood that maybe it's just a matter of household management. Economy comes from Old Greek and means household management. And maybe it's just a matter of pricing 
both the capital in terms of actual impact on the climate, pricing labor better so we don't have people locked into tedious tasks or structural systemic slavery, which we have today. A encapsulates this uh, mysterious variable called technological innovation that economists don't really look at up until today because of its enormous transformative power. Um, and this is really the GDP function in its very simplicity by Robert Solow, 1958, and we still use it when we plan the economy. And this is where I work today, top down, at the EU, as well as nationally, uh, advising policy. But this is not what we're going to talk about for the next uh, couple of, I guess, half hour, 45 minutes. And please, I like it to be a dialogue, right? So just interrupt. Um, no, we're not going to talk about top down. We're going to talk about bottom up. And for this, I'm going to link back to um, this that uh, Cyrus showed you earlier today. Do you remember it? Yeah. Did yesterday, this morning? Yeah. Yes. Um, that's how much uh, time is malleable. Um, did he explain where this picture comes from? No. All right. So it's uh, actually the designer of the internet, Paul Barron, that was asked way back when to design a communication system that was sturdy enough so that the Russians wouldn't be able to take it down. This was in the rise of the Cold War. And this is what gave birth to the design of the internet. Um, so the, the task, according to him, was, OK, we can't have this kind of system, because if the Russians take us out, they just take this middle node, and we don't have any communication network. In this decentralized, it's, uh, it's harder to take us down, but quite easy if you know the central node still. Uh, and what he wanted us to move towards was a communication system that was like this, like an organism, like self-healing almost. The internet didn't turn out like this, because you have Google and Amazon controlling 90 plus sort of percent of everything. Then so, this is why blockchain is here and interesting. But this is also how you can look at any technology according to me, whether it's energy, whether it's production. What I'm holding here in my book is uh, a, a man that has guided my way of thinking a lot when we look at how to design interesting systems from the bottom up if we're supposed to leap from the politicians and forget them for two minutes. So I'm going to read just an extract where this book is from 1986. It's called The Whale and the Reactor. It talks about the rise of computation and this book, in my opinion, has never been more relevant than now. Um, Langdon Winner writes about what is going to be the future energy system. And he writes this. Just as Plato and Aristotle posed the question, what is the best form of political society? So, also, in an age of high technology, ought we to ask, what forms of technology are compatible with this kind of society we want to build. So when it comes to energy, he asked, would it be nuclear power administered by a benign priesthood of scientists? Would it be coal and oil brought to you by large MNCs? Or would it be the soft energy path brought to you by you and your neighbors? That was energy, but he talks about this as a methodology for looking at any new system. And this is where my love for 3D printing comes in. Having production systems that are distributed and that, from a social perspective, make us connect to matter again. Um, so personally, what I did was a couple of years ago, but this was kind of still when, when I was in the anti-capitalist mode, is that I started working for this company called Maersk. And my task was, this was my secret mission, I was going to disrupt them from within. I didn't know this, but I was going to disrupt them from within with 3D printing, because I had seen this third industrial revolution. We're not going to need these people that are disconnecting us from matter. So I applied a job there. 
and was working for many years on sourcing engine parts and working with engine innovation. That was just sort of the cover mission. I was just trying to bring this conversation about 3D printing. So this is how our cover mission looks. I 3D printed an engine part. A long story, if we don't have this on board a vessel, it'll take many, many weeks uh, and cost many, much, much money to get it on board. So the idea was maybe we could have 3D printers on board the vessels. That was the sort of cover idea. Today they actually have this. Um, but what I did was that I put up a uh, YouTube clip with myself explaining the idea and the vision. It was only an idea by then. Uh, and put it out on YouTube. And that's the great thing when you put out ideas on the internet, right? You can get all kinds of interesting input. Uh, and this is the most commented, uh, most commented. And just, um, yeah. Yeah, just one of many comments about my hair. There's another one, uh, WTF, what's up with the woman's hair, LOL. Um, but they should print her a hairbrush. I kind of get what they're saying when I see this picture here. Uh, this is me um, about five months after I posted that video. I was really at the lowest part of the hierarchy in Maersk, yet I was invited to speak at the World Shipping Forum in China in 2014, talking about 3D printing as it was going to revolutionize everything. I really thought, OK, now maybe the industry would want to self-disrupt, start talking about decentralized production systems. But what we came to see were kind of these parts, just a reproduction of existing parts. And they just, 3D printing just got into this box of, let's use it to optimize and become even faster and get our parts even faster so that our ships are even more efficient so we can keep shipping that many goods. So this is one part, for example, a big propeller out of Port of Rotterdam. Uh, really interesting. They're cutting the lead time from five months to five days by 3D printing it. Really cool. They're saving um, a lot of material as well because 3D printing is additive, not subtractive. But it's still incremental innovation. It's still to power these big vessels that are supposed to come with containers of standardized goods. So I moved on. Um, but this is also something you're seeing in the entire 3D printing space, not really interesting products. And so this is what I hope that we can talk about, how to look at this technology with totally new eyes. Because or else we're going to get kind of these things. I don't know, does this really solve a huge one and a half degree challenge, right? We all need wheelbarrows for our memory cards. Or this. Yeah, exactly. What's a memory card? Um, but this is what you'll see if you roam around in the 3D printing very nerdy space as of now, is that we're seeing these kind of crappy plastic stuff that don't really solve big problems and especially just produce more plastic perhaps. Um, another one, my favorite, a coin holder. Again, who owns coins anymore? I'm not sure. Um, or a battery holder. Do you absolutely need this? Isn't this solving, like, I've always needed this, right? <laughs> always had to know A to A, I don't know, okay. Uh, another really morbid one I found just uh, a month ago. Uh, this is a Spanish company. Um, this is the re uh, commercial from their, um, let, let me just pause two seconds. Uh, this, I need a segue here. Um, this is a company called Narbon. 3D memories, and they thought that the best way to use 3D printing was to um, create a or solve the problem of kind of disconnect from your dead relatives. So the idea is that if you ship the ashes of your relative, Narbon will create fancy jewelry out of the ashes of your relative. So this is from the commercial. This is the woman who's missing uh, her sister, I believe it is. Those are the ashes of her sister. You just combine it with um, a gel and a bit of water, and then you get fancy jewelry so that you always have your relatives with you. And now she's happy again. <laughs> Yeah, and you can get vases, you can get all kind of jewelry, super. 
and now she's happy again and yeah that's fantastic isn't it all right um i'm I like it's kind of to to joke about death or grief it kind of feels a bit morbid but uh, the point is we're seeing a lot of weird applications and I'm really excited about having such a diverse set of people looking at this technology because any technology that comes to market, a new technology, the moment to redefine systems is like just a brief window of opportunity before someone claims that technology and puts it into existing boxes or new really weird boxes. Um, so the most important thing for me is let's not just use 3D printing to get a little bit lighter stuff or a little bit uh, less transportation. Let's use it to really redefine how we connect to matter because or else we're just going to cut off the branch. We're sitting on a tiny bit uh, slower. We're still cutting it off. So the metaphor, and I think I alluded to this on Monday, was what is the Instagram moment of 3D printing? That sort of creative crossing of many technologies that might redefine how we relate to the product. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is provide you three perspectives. And after each, we're going to sort of discuss a little bit. Okay? So the first one, and it's very much along the lines of what Ida talked about, uh, so it's quite perfect. The first one is what if products act like software? And you're kind of into this mindset already. Um, this guy that I showed on Monday, Cody, is uh, a perfect example of this. Basically, uh, zeros and ones, and the product is always in continuous development. Uh, maybe you don't want to follow Cody, but maybe you'll follow your favorite designer, um, 3D printing designer, and get an update every time the designer has a new design for you. You just put the old part in the shredder, and you get the new part out. So circular, because this is one single material, plastic, um, enabling more circular systems, uh, but also then enabling that the product is always in continuous development, just like when you get a software update on your phone, which I don't have here. Right? Um, and this is also enabled by regenerative design, so software tools that only enable us to always uh, design better and cooler products. Um, so this is Autodesk's regenerative design. You just, it's the cross in between 3D printing and AI. So you just have a very intimate dialogue almost with the software where you always I I I iterate on the design sp spit out by uh, generative design, this tool. Um, and I think we're going to have to accept these kind of alien-like structures. We can't dream about them uh, ourselves, so we're going to have to have a lot of help from the AI algorithms. And all of these iterations will be at zero marginal cost. Every new iteration is just a little tweak in the software, not a long kind of process of redesigning a product as per traditional manufacturing technologies. So this whole paradigm shift we're seeing is in the old, you had to produce standardized goods and a lot of them in order to get return of your investment. Huge production facilities and machines that only could spit out the same cup or the same uh, vase or whatever. And here, with 3D printing, you have one investment and then on the same print bed, you can print any different uh, part and since everything is controlled in the software at zero marginal cost, 3D printer doesn't care whether it's a bunch of similar cups, identical cups, or all customized. Um, so this is probably the best example that we will know. You've seen this, right? Adidas, Future D, Futurecraft. Have you uh, tried to get one of those 3D printed? Yeah. Have you gotten them? No, I know, it's like impossible. Uh, but they have a 10x strategy. So uh, two years ago it was 100,000, last year ago 1 million, and this year supposedly 10 million 3D printed uh, shoes. And this is the sole that is 3D printed. Yes. Yes, the sole. It's only the sole here, yes, that is 3D printed. In terms of our challenge, in terms of circularity, what is interested is that you have 
one and the same material. That makes it easier to recycle. And in order to have interesting features and make it comfortable, before we had layers of different material in order to have nice features and make it soft in the middle, and etc. cetera. Uh, here, you're controlling this in the lattice structure, in a very complex honeycomb structure. And again, the 3D printer doesn't care whether the 3D prints that or something linear box-ish, right? So that's going to be quite interesting to follow. And especially if they dare, and we let's hold them accountable, they're indicating, but they're not promising. But it would be interesting if we could hold them accountable and ask, couldn't you be a Spotify for shoes? That would really be interesting. Yes? Um, just to add on to so any of the questions. Yeah. Um, I worked last year with a team of users. Uh, so oh, we wow. Currently work in a business model where you kind of risk, where you can um, have material that's recyclable. So you kind of went, subscribe the shoe, have it for a couple of weeks, months, and return it. So yes. kind of circular, uh, yes. kind of the problem is just kind of scale it, but they're working yeah. on the product material to recycle. So they're yeah. working on it. So, so we believe in it, right? It's, yeah. You've been there, yeah. they're thinking about it, Spotify for shoes, yeah. why do you need to own your shoe? Yeah. You can so just have... It's not always done with the production, so they're using that speed factory, have like additive right. manufacturing kind of no waste yeah. in the production. Now it's kind of how can we create material that's usable for the user, yeah. um, that you have the shoe like not only once, but kind of three times before we set. Yeah. Exactly. And there's an incentive, a very clear incentive for the customer to, <laughs> to come back with a shoe when it's yeah. going broke. Uh, and especially if, again, same material here, so much easier to have fully closed circular production loop. Yes? Uh, I don't know how much, many details you know about this, but uh, do you know if they are proposing that uh, you can in some way print it yourself, like a one-time... I think we have an expert here that could address that. Let's um, get the inside so secrets. So they just announced, um, not this kind of shoe, but for the Ultra Boost, kind of um, produced to be the consumer. So understanding what the consumer wants and then redesign it to the consumer uh, together. So they have um, the speed factory, you can kind of customize the shoe 100% yourself, uh, and they can produce it in 20 minutes, and you can get it like next day. Um, so we're working on it just having it next year. Maybe two, three years um, in America. And, uh, but it's still them, they're, they're still producing it. They're still Physically. producing it. They're, they're having it at two factories right now, one in Germany, one in America, a speed factory, where it's kind of, it's called 100% automated uh, production. Um, but also we're having different kind of project, kind of stock factory, where we're having it in malls, let's say 100 squares, uh, where you can um, create the shoes with the consumer together um, at the same time. So not, you're not able now to so build no, it in your apartment, yet. but no. you yeah. will be able yeah. um, to build a shoe in a store factory uh, or in a mall. Yeah, because no, but what I think is would be the, the interesting part is when it, if and when it could move into your home. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so. But so then you, you would want a system where everyone has 3D printers at home. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that could be also linear thinking, that we have 7 billion 3D printers. No, but the, no, no that, that's not what I mean. Yeah. The point is more that you could then don't, not, not have to go to a third party, but yeah. actually just go to, kind of like decentralized, go to whoever yeah. has one. Yeah. Because you want a shoe and you don't have a 3D printer, but the, the guy uh, 300 meters down the street has one. Yeah. But it's also happening, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The these are, these are the, the existing, right? The, the question of ownership is what I'm interested in. If they can kind of make it distributed in a way where they can, because it's not a viable business strategy just to give out the drawings and then you will never, I mean, for them at least, yeah. I guess. So they would want you to be able to maybe stream the algorithm for the Ultra Boost yeah. and that's what you pay for. They don't have any of the production. That's also interesting. Yeah. yeah. But the, that would, yeah, yeah, cool. There's some comment to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean this is actually one of the, the point where the retailing industry can be disrupted because Adidas then, instead of having shops, can have like spots where they 3D print shoes for you. Yeah. You go there, you put your feet into the machine, and they customize your shoes right. for you in that way. Or it's not even owned from Adidas, but from a third party that can use Adidas software to 3D print you a customized shoes, yeah. as well as any other software or whatever, any other producer. So it's like the disruptive aspect of the retail. Yeah. There. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of like, if we're honing back on the challenge, the one and a half degree, right? 
is uh, what if you, you came to a world where nobody ever would tell you, I'm sorry, we don't have this shoe in your size. Because you always have it in your size. You don't have it in 37, 37 and a half, you know, where it's only like length or width. We have it in your perfect size because it's only customized and perfectly. We have scanned your foot so it's uniquely perfected for you. Uh, interesting from a power relation, do they then own the IP of my foot? <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, something we can discuss. Um, moving forward, this is a young woman called Alexandra Ion from the Hafno Plasner is Institute that I've had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, uh, brainstorming a lot in the 3D printing space. And she turns things around, take it to the next level when it comes to single material usage. She thinks about material as machines. So here you'll see a door handle printed in one go and the same material, but just because of the level of sort of uh, complexity she can control digitally and the intricate lattice structures, uh, she has a workable door handle just like that and one the same material. Is this interesting? She called these meta materials smart materials. Where is this again? Hasso Plasner. In Germany or? Yes, in Germany. I can connect you if you're interested in knowing Alexander Ion, she's super cool. Uh, a computer scientist, and by the way, that's only on a desktop 3D printer. So these really uh, cheap, under uh, 1,000 euro printers. Um, some of the value shifts we're seeing in if production uh, acts, or a product act like software is this customization, and we do it after there is a demand. So before we've produced Thanks to, uh, throughout the first, second, industrial, uh, third industrial revolution, we produced a massive bunch of products and then we hoped there was a demand for it. We kind of cross finger, hope somebody will buy it. Uh, now we wait until somebody actually wants to buy it before we press print. So huge material savings, uh, obsolete parts and so on. Uh, economies of scope, that's about uh, being able to um, again, get return of your investment, not by having scales of standardized products. And customer could access, not own, hyper spotification of everything. Uh, producers sell and remember, right? They design in an incentive to get the part back, not just sell and then, oops, not my problem anymore. They own much more the responsibility. And products develop not even in a cycle, but in a spiral. If you look at this uh, goal, sustainable production, where we have it, like this one, the eight one, what if that was like a string theory kind of instead, right? Always in continuous, you know, never going back, but always with a forward motion. That's how I think of it, as, at least. So, the obvious question is, Can I ask who cares? <laughs> yes? Can I ask one thing? So, is the material already that good that it can actually, like, go louder? If the material is already that good that it can go through this spiral without... Last time. <laughs> is the material already that good that it can go through this spiral without losing its quality at any point in time? Because there are certain materials like steel that don't decrease in quality, but yeah. for example like textiles or plastic, like. Yeah. Are there any developments in that area? No, there needs to be much, much more. And the same thing is with plastics. It needs to be the right kind of thermoplastics. Uh, we need much, much more uh, research into new materials. And so finally, that's what uh, big companies are finally putting their resources in. Biomaterials, uh, better thermoplastics, uh, better biodegradability, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that, this is where I'm hoping the most materials is, is alpha mega here. Um, anyone sort of who wants to serve, is this, does this resonate with some of your ideas? So you would care? Yeah? I mean, it was a collaboration with, it's kind of on your question, is, there was a collaboration between, I think, Boeing and Siemens when they were printing the turbine blades for the Rolls-Royce engines. Yeah. The, sorry. There was a collaboration. <laughs> Between uh, Boeing and um, and Siemens and Rolls Royce to print print the, the turbine blades of mm -hmm. their engines, mm. and obviously they're going into the massive Airbuses and stuff like that. So the the safety specifications and the integrity of the product was absolute. But for the first time, a printed uh, titanium uh, blade was uh, was more had more integral strength than the traditional methods. 
Yeah. So that was proven to be and lightweight and all the honeycombing and everything. Yeah. So that was, you know, for the flight, which is so uh, precise and yeah. safety is paramount. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, thank you for sharing that. And aviation weight is everything, right? Yeah. So that is why they want to have these alien like structures. And the honeycomb structures are actually what is uh, on many of the 3D printed aviation parts is the internal. So instead of having mass massive uh, uh, steel and titanium and aluminium, they have these weird structures inside. And yes, they are stronger, mm -hmm. you find, with 3D printing. But you have to think uh, very differently. Like a bird yes. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So these crazy structures that we can, we can dream about. Um, in maritime, it's not weight that we were looking for. We were looking for time between overhaul. So how much we could extend the lifetime of products. Because when we have to yeah, overhaul a, a vessel, you had to dock it, lift it up, and change the engine parts. And if you could extend that time between each overhaul by having stronger parts, that was the most interesting part for maritime. So there's different million dollar question to ask whether, depending on which industry you're looking at. Okay, so we do care about this one, that's good. And uh, if you wanna dive more into this perspective, this Instagram moment of 3D printing, just reach out and I'd love to brainstorm more. The next one is, what if manufacturers think like gardeners? Like, I think this is also very related to what Ida talked about. It's just a different twist of not looking at yourself as a manufacturer, but as a gardener. And with 3D printing, the, th the first thing is it's additive, right? So you just, oh, let's see if we, it's not, all oh, right, it's not a video. But most of us have seen a 3D printer, yes? Additive, one layer at a time. And so this is really like nature, grows apart, layer at a time instead of all the other ones that are subtractive, the different technologies where we take a huge block of something, then we subtract, 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 until we get the final part. So this is beautiful in terms of reconnecting with nature, thinking a bit like Mama Earth. Um, and this, oh, that was the video. Okay, it was just super short, okay. Um, and this growing part enables us to create weird structures again, This this view between uh, AI and uh, 3D printing is actually built on biological laws, is built on biomimicry, uh, because Mother Nature has perfected how to use as little material to build as strong parts as possible. So if we just depict, depict how he, she has done this, or he, she, it has done this, perfected this over millennia, uh, we can just copy that. So that's why you're seeing these structures um, just this hinge, for example, this is produced by, designed by a, um, a human, and this is designed by an AI that is built on the laws of biomimicry. So 75% weight that you save, and it's as strong. This is um, General Electric's, but this is five times stronger. So not only lighter, but five times stronger. Um, so really interesting. But this is still a bit in the incremental innovation space from my uh, view. So we're going to move away from that a little bit. Uh, we're going to look into um, how you're thinking like a, manufa or like a gardener when you use whatever input material you have at hand. What I showed you before was titanium, the luxurious stuff. But what I have here is, um, if we can hear him, let's see if we can hear him. This is Hans Fouché um, from South Africa. I think we should hear him. Um, I'm just looking over here. Oh, yes, now I know. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Just there. External, yeah. Nope. If you just took the external, that should be good. Yeah. Entertainment room? No? No? Okay. It worked before when I did that. Okay. All right. So, this is uh, Hans Fouché. 
I met him in, uh, in South Africa a couple years ago. Most of my 3D printing research is not Silicon Valley. It's actually where, where the real problems exist. Um, and uh, so he works with 3D printing so that it works for an African context. And uh, for that, he uses whatever material he has at hand. And he tries to just build stuff that is good enough for his immediate problem. So this is uh, using plastics, um, uh, printing a car wrench. Let's see if we can get him to talk about it as well. Strong um, yep. plastic parts exactly to get the paradigm shift of people that you can make really strong things mm -hmm. with a 3D printer. You don't need to, to make the whole small little nice things. You can make a part. It's, and it's good enough. It's good enough. Yeah, I've, 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 um, if you put my name in on YouTube, you'll find. Uh, um, a clip where I'm actually getting my car up with ah, I will, I will. They so can do that. I was really excited, as you can hear. That's, that's a moment where I'm like, oh, and it's good enough. That's so cool. And that's a shift by, you know, accepting that plastic sometimes is good enough, depending on the context. It doesn't have to be the coolest and the most awesome seemingly materials. Some places we just go for good enough. Yes, Mia. I'm just curious, where, where did you get the plastic? Locally, plastic sourced locally. Yeah, so, so like old plastic bags? Yes. Yeah. So a lot of these plastics actually are recycled. Yeah. Um, I met some other people that uh, used plastics that had uh, uh, stranded uh, along the beaches in South Africa. So uh, really cool and making, but it's like different 3D printers. Let me know if you want to know more about them because they're not the kind of 3D printers you'll buy in the market uh, brought to you by the classical people. These are people that have built them themselves with, you know, Raspberry Pis and, you know, really cool. Um, so that's one way to think like a gardener and then you'll end up with all kinds of different interesting solution. Now I'm mentioning Adidas again. I am not paid by them, but I just wanted to show nonetheless that people want to buy things that are made out of sea waste. For example, the shoes that I'm wearing now are the most expensive shoes I have. They're made out of fishnets, old fishnets, right? Like imagine pitching that five years ago to the board in Adidas. People will want to buy 300 euro kind of sneakers and they're made out of sea, sea you know, fishnets. They would really think you would be ridiculous. But yes, there's a value shift going on that is interesting. Um, so hope that can inspire. Other cool examples for how to use the plastic that you have at hand. This is kind of thinking like a gardener. Whatever you have at hand, you're entrepreneurial with that. So we need to move away from a standardized view of our input materials and be clever about what we have close. Okay. Yes? Uh, the picture up on the right corner, <coughs> is that the thing on the right hand side, is that melting? The, the, the plastic and then it, it, and then it prints immediately? Or? Yes, so it'll uh, melt in the fuel, no, sorry. This is put in a shredder. Uh, and it's turned into pellets, not filament, but pellets, and then it'll melt in the fuel nozzle. Yeah. Uh, so it depends on if you want to do filament-based 3D printing or pellets-based. Most of the things I've seen in South Africa are pellet-based. Um, cool. Um, using things you have at hand is also what you need to do if you're going to colonize space. So this is the first part printed with uh, a material from a meteorite that fell in Argentina a couple years ago that NASA 3D printed. Again, alien-like structures, but now we have an input that is also alien. Uh, and the idea is that we're not going to bring the material with us from Earth. We're going to use whatever we have out in space. Yeah? Or uh, like Dr. Anna uh, Meyer from Delft University, she broke my mind that was two years ago when she said, no, better yet, we bring bacteria with us that we put in a 3D printer uh, and then they are uh, put in a gel that we put up in a 3D print in a structure. So we 3D print bacteria in a gel and then we feed them moon dust or Mars dust or whatever and they will eat this dust and produce 3D structures. So we, instead of printing the final sort of structures, we print the little soldiers that's going to build them for us, taking it to the next level. Um, this is early in the stadium. She has so far uh, been able to do five millimeters. 
So quite early in the stadium, but something to look at. Um, then we have as well uh, the world of 4D printing. Uh, and this is, I think, a lot and also uh, Anna Meyer's spirit is think the, think the manufacturing process all the way to its end. Don't use time as an enemy, but as a friend. And so here, for example, is four-dimensional printing out of uh, Harvard and MIT where you have plastic that will, when contact with water, will self-assemble. So when we know how materials respond to time, instead of building the strongest materials to withstand time, withstand corrosion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we use those properties as a friend in our design process. Other ways to think in four dimensions, the fourth dimension here is time, yeah? Uh, is this young student, uh, also out of Delft University, she 3D prints a cracker with a mixture of yeast and flour and a bit of seeds, and three days later, you have this mushroom popping out and um, out of the cracker together with some herbs. You can design it yourself. Um, or this is really giving back to nature, in fact, a biodegradable um, plastic bottle that we just can throw out and it becomes soil. This is 60 days later. So maybe we can consumption, consume, and every consumption is a gift back to nature. Maybe. So that's um, a little bit on uh, thinking like a gardener. Local good enough could be something we inspire to. <coughs> Growing, not extracting. Materials, let's not treat them as dumb. Let's treat them as smart. Uh, and let's treat time as a friend, not an enemy. Um, Jan Messen, who cares? Um, people care in here? Yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah? You still have me? Great. So the final is going to be super quick, but it's my favorite one. The final one is, what if, instead of designing with the rule form follows function, which is the classical design rule, what if form could follow fiction? Yay! <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's not my rule. It's some really brainy architect I stole with pride from. Because um, what we're seeing today with 3D printing is going back a little bit to this reproduction versus transformation. This is um, cement houses, 10 of them, printed in 48 hours. Cost about 5,000 per house. It's super cool. And housing problem is a big problem. Don't take me wrong, it's a huge problem. But I find it fascinating that we 3D print square boxes. When we just learned that they can produce weird structures at zero marginal cost, it's kind of an offense to 3D printing, mm -hmm. right? We put them in the existing boxes. Um, so we have this tendency to just reproduce what we're seeing around us, but we need to start dreaming that matter in a digital space, all the matter around us will change. And if it changes, how does that impact our neural pathways? Have you ever heard think outside the box? How can I think outside the box if I live in one? Honestly? So, if we 3D print these kind of structures, Vincent Cabello, he's a Belgian architect, and this is a concept model of a sea scraper. He says by 2048, we can 3D print these sea scrapers where we will live 20,000 people per sea scraper. Water world, Kevin Costner kind of, but in a different, uh, more beautiful utopian scenario. You will sort of sail in here to your sea scraper. You will be chilling with the orcas here. And now how does that impact our brain, our thoughts, our creativity? And if that's not the ultimate hack that matter can do to us, then Mind me. So when we want to look for radical solutions that the IPCC demands of us, how can we use matter to not only be responsible, but have the most awesome time of our life whilst we're here? Yes. So whenever you do, whether it's 3D printing or another technology, be mindful. Don't reproduce. Go back to the problem you want to solve. Don't 3D print me a house. 
design me something I can live in, or better yet, love and dance in. Thank you.